Well, it's good to be back. Uh, Shally and I, we got to, to go on a, a little vacation to Pennsylvania to celebrate with her family, uh, her aunt's uh, 100th birthday. She was 100 on July the 4th, and so she got to be there that Saturday afterwards for a, a birthday party, and she stayed for quite a while. Uh, but with a lot of times people being 100 years old, she had a birthday party, the next day she was in the hospital, okay? But uh, she is doing, doing pretty well for, for someone that's a, 100 years old. It was neat to, to be there and uh, spend some time and just, that is where Shally, growing up, would take her vacations uh, in Titusville, Pennsylvania. That's where her dad was from. And so that's her whole childhood vacation. That's where they go every summer. So it was neat to, to go there and uh, spend some time. That is where, in the United States, the first oil well uh, was dug uh, there in Titusville. Uh, the Heisman Trophy, John Heisman, that's where he grew up as well, went to school there at Titusville. So there's a neat, neat history, just like neat histories wherever you go. Uh, just a lot of neat things to be a part of. This morning, we're going to do a new series, a short little series. It's just on the, the good life, the good life, thinking about the, the good life. And I want to start with this question, what makes for a good life? What makes for a good life? Now, I'm not asking what makes life good, okay? What makes life good? That's pretty easy because you can find that on, on T-shirts. And so we have some of those slides to look at. Uh, there, there's one of those. Okay, life is, life is good. Just sitting back, taking it easy. Life is good. Another one is maybe it's golf, okay, is what makes life good for you. Or maybe it's laying in a hammock, okay, just taking it easy, the, the, the breeze coming through and it looks like, uh, maybe it's there in Hawaii or something like that. Maybe that's where it takes place. Or maybe to take a road trip, go on vacation. Uh, that's what it is in a, in a V-bus like that, uh, to, to just go. Or maybe swimming, okay? All, all those things are good in life. Things like camping and maybe pets or music or picnics and hiking, water skiing. The list goes on and on and on. But that's not what I'm asking. As we, we think about, you know, what makes life good, a lot of those things do make life good. But what makes for a good life? It's a little bit different, okay? That going to the, the swimming hole uh, is, is pretty good for a little while, but not maybe to stay there forever, right? Uh, as just a lot of those things are. As I can remember when my dad retired, you know, working uh, all those years and uh, most of the time it was usually getting up very early to, to go to work, uh, usually getting up at four o'clock or something like that. Uh, one of the jobs, it was two o'clock. And, and then when he retired, he said, yeah, this is going to be nice. And so uh, some of the proper that they have, there's a, a little pond on it. So dad started fishing. Okay. He fished some for about a month, okay? And then that, that got kind of tiring, okay? Every once in a while, it's kind of neat to do. It's kind of neat to look forward to it, but it's something good for life, but it doesn't make for a, a good life just all the time uh, doing, doing that. It's like Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, he was one of the president's men, back to President Nixon. And he was called Charles then, but in the Christian circles, he's called Chuck. But Carl, uh, Charles Colson, uh, he spent seven months in prison because of, of the Watergate aspect. And he was there to, to spend a lot of time. But while he was in jail, he became a Christian. And then he went before the, the committee and he told a lot of things. He wasn't going to, but he became a Christian and felt like something needed to be different. But he still spent seven months in jail. And then from that experience in being in jail, he became the founder of Prison Fellowship, which has prison ministries in many places around the world. Many of them uh, are here in the United States. I've had friends that have, have ministered with uh, Prison Fellowship. And also what he, is, he did was he wrote many books. And one of the books that he wrote was called The Good Life. 
What makes life good? Because most of his life, it was spent different ways. I think he was in the Marines for many years, and then he got in politics, and, and he, he served with, with uh, President Nixon, and, and just a lot of those things. And he talked about when he was going to retire. He just saw that what he was going to do is take it easy, and golf was going to be a big part of that. And after he retired, he still liked to golf, but there had to be something still more. And that's when he started the, the prison fellowship ministry. He started traveling and helping people within their walk with the Lord. Oh, part of life being good, he still liked to golf, but it wasn't what life was all about. And you know, that's true. A lot of neat things we like to do. We like to take maybe a road trip. Maybe we like to go fishing. Maybe we like to, to, to golf or many, many different things. But what makes for a good life? That's been one of those things people have been asking for a long time. If you go back to Aristotle, Aristotle uh, was looking at this whole aspect in philosophy. For them, it was the the state uh, of having a good indwelling spirit. So what makes a good indwelling spirit within our lives? And so that was a part of Aristotle looking. And there's been other poets, thinkers, philosophers, exploring many, many aspects. What makes for a good life? Almost all of them will deal with possessions. Some settle with possessions. It's all about the things we have. But all of them will go into that. Is it about the things that we have here upon this earth? And so from the beginning... People have been looking that. Maybe Adam and Eve went a little bit there about having more, right? More possessions, more things. And so did Solomon. And we have some of Solomon's thinking in Scripture uh, when he writes that that little book called Ecclesiastes. It's one of those kind of crazy little books in the Old Testament because uh, if you, you read it and you're not feeling very up, if you're a little depressed, Don't read it, okay? Because he's looking from a worldly standpoint, okay? He is looking at everything from a worldly standpoint. If it's just about this world, you're not ever going to find any satisfaction. You won't find it in pursuing things uh, upon this earth. And so he writes Ecclesiastics, which the the little letter of the book uh, says the teacher. He's a teacher. It's not mentioned by name. But it's basically the pursuit of just looking at this earth to find a good life. Here's some of the things he writes in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. He said, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine, embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days we have of our lives. So I undertook projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. So here's Solomon. He is the king in a time when he became the king, 
Because remember, his dad was the king before that brought great might uh, to, to the country because David was a warrior and God was with him. Also brought a lot of real estate and all this was then given to Solomon as king. And so what he does, it was basically a time of peace and he brought a lot of wealth to the people of Israel, to Jerusalem. He did a lot of things, a lot of things. But basically there was no restrictions. What did he say guided him? Whatever my eyes saw, I was after that. Whatever my heart wanted, that became mine. He was king. He had money. He had power. So there was really nothing that that stopped him. And after looking at all this, the land, the homes, the gold, the silver, the servants, the wives, as he reflected upon this, he says, my life's empty. Okay? It was all vain. The few short years of my life, what I pursued did not bring happiness. He's a pretty good one to look at, right? Because basically who he was, there was no restraints, And so he went down the road of these things as far as anybody could go. And he came back and said, I didn't find life. I didn't find satisfaction or joy. Solomon Solomon lived about 900 years before uh, Jesus was born here upon this earth. So we've had this teaching for about 3,000 years, okay? 3,000 years of this teaching of someone that said, I had no limits And I went down as far as possible, and I didn't find it. So he's telling us that have limits, okay? Our roads might be a little bit short (laughs) that that we can go down. You're not going to find the good life by just the things here upon this earth. But people try it all the time. Maybe we try it from time to time too. If I just had that new house, I'd be happy. If I just had a a better paying job, if if I just had a a new wardrobe, a new car, a a new phone, okay, a a new phone, all that, uh, or or maybe if I won the lottery, okay, that, have you ever ran that in your mind? You start off, man, if I could just win a million dollars, and then you start thinking, man, if it was just no 10 million, you know, and no, a hundred million, you know, that billion. You know, because we, we, we start thinking, even in our mind, we see there would not be satisfaction because that million wouldn't carry us as far as what we would go or want to go, right? We, we start going with that. And so Solomon tells us with about 3,000 years of this teaching, it's not the way to a good life. Oh, there are good things in life. Okay, a house, a good paying job. Th- those things are, are good in life, but it doesn't make a good life. More possessions don't equal a good life. You ever watch the show Hoarders? Okay. Not only does the pursuit of more stuff not make for a good life, sometimes it can actually bring pain. That's what Solomon was saying. It brought him a lot of pain. Just many of the pursuits that he had. We look at Adam and Eve You look at them, they had everything. Everything was theirs. Other than God said, you can't eat from one tree. They were not satisfied. No. If I just had more, if I could just eat and have that knowledge, but also as Satan tricked them, you can be like God. Man, I want to be like God. You see, there's a contrast in Scripture. It finally hit my mind this week because somebody had to teach it and and I I learned it. The contrast in Philippians chapter 2, when we look at Jesus, he he did not look and grasp, uh, look at the authority as God, the, the glory of God as a thing to be grasped. See, that's just a picture of Adam and Eve. We're going to grasp being God. That wasn't Jesus. He emptied himself, right? He emptied himself. I'm not going to grasp it, want it, that this is what's going to bring the good life. Jesus became a servant. 
a better life, a better life. So often we get caught up in what the world has to offer that makes for things that are good for living, okay? But it doesn't make a good life. That is, Solomon says it's like chasing after the wind. Doesn't that seem to, to, to look like a lot of times the world we live in? It's kind of like a little kid out there trying to catch the wind, okay? Just going out and, and how crazy that is. And, the, and a lot of times that's kind of the way the world looks like and maybe sometimes us. As we just think it's about pursuing the things of this world. But see, God gives a different path. A path, a purpose, a meaning to help us. And so the few years we have here upon this earth, we need to learn it right? We, we need to learn this because we only have a short time. What makes for a good life? And we're going to look at a couple things this morning. We're going to, over three weeks, look at six things, but just two of those this morning. No, for Glenn, let's look at all six today, okay? <laughs> he was saying that uh, Josh only preached 20 minutes, and so we got to make up for that from last week. No, we'll do two of them. We'll do two of them today. That the, the first one is, is gratitude. You know, gratitude is the first key to a good life. Gratitude. And maybe it's the most important. Gratitude. Seeing life as good, meaningful, that there's so many things we are to be grateful for. Right? There was a, a, a long study done by a professor called Dr. Robert uh, Emons. And uh, he's a professor at University of California. He's written quite a few books. And basically, it's about the importance of gratitude and being thankful. And he's found a, a lot of different things through this. And he sees it's important for us to keep a list of what we are thankful for. Even more important than a list is every day make a list of what we are thankful for. And he has found this through his study with a, a lot of people involved, that basically people that keep a weekly list of what they are thankful for, they will exercise more, they have fewer physical problems, they have less illnesses, they feel better, and they're more optimistic in life. But his study didn't in there. Basically, he looked at young people, uh, young adults that, that keep this list, they will be more alert, more enthusiastic, more determined, more intentive, and also more willing to help other people. Uh, those that are sick, if he, he made the experiment for, experiment for 21 days with some of those that, that were sick, that basically, if they will keep a list, and he looked at this for 21 days, so it's not like this is forever looking at it, but just looking and keeping a list of how grateful they are, that they had better moods. Uh, so often, their feelings towards other people corrected as well. They were able to sleep better uh, while they were sick and things like that. For children, if they practice giving thanks Throughout the week on a daily basis, they are, they are more positive. They have more, pos, uh, more positive in their attitudes. And so when you think of this, that seems to be enough to be grateful, right? That it just helps us in life. No wonder the Old Testament, there's a passage that says, you know, laughter is good medicine, okay? It's kind of that, that so, same aspect there. But basically he found other things, that grateful people had saw less importance on physical things, material things. They judged other people less, and especially how other people use their material possessions, uh, less judgmental. They were less envious of others and more likely to share, helping other people out. And that's some of the things he saw, just looking at people. And how does this play? What does this do? That's, it's a big force just from the aspect of being grateful. 
being grateful. And there's ways to help us to do that. For him, he said to keep a, a, a weekly list. So start it over every week. And, and that's something that helped. But that's something that can, can help us. Uh, if you have prayer or say grace at meal times, there's three times a day or four or five, depending on how many meals. You might be a hobbit or something. Uh, that uh, that you, you have to, to just say thanks, to show gratitude for the blessings, if it's the, the blessing of the food that we have, but also that can run further and further and further just by taking those three times. Also, you think of other times, like maybe your family does. Uh, if you get together for Thanksgiving when all the food's ready and, and then you have a prayer before it, a neat thing to do is just go around the room and saying at least one thing that each one is thankful for. You know, it, it can make a big difference. And then you dive into the turkey and gravy and all that kind of stuff. Because it's about Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is about thanking the Almighty, okay? Because of who he is, what he has done. That we need to, to learn to give thanks. And sometimes, even though it's been a part of our life, we may say, man, I'm really not. And so we start, right? Get, giving thanks. It is something that needs to be taught as well, right? Right? Taught to, to give thanks instead of just living a life where we want more and more stuff. So gratitude makes for a good life. And this is why the Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to experience a good life. And gratitude, giving thanks from our heart, is one of those things. But the second thing is purpose. Purpose is a second key to, to a good life. And you, you can see that purpose. What is your purpose? Now, starting back when I went to college and then seeing since then, you can see this a lot of times with those that are college age. And especially if they go off someplace else, like if they are going to, to college. So often they may be in a different state, not around people they know, okay? All new circumstances, all new people, and so often the doors open to do whatever you want to do. And some will go with that aspect. It's about fun, okay? I, I'm going to go for fun. And, and so this is the way they, they go, and it's, a, it's about party and just having fun. The other day we were setting... Uh, not too long before we got on the, the plane in Ohio, we were uh, eating a meal. Uh, it's one of my happy places to eat, Skyline Chili, okay? Uh, we were eating at Skyline Chili, and there was two guys, probably in their 40s, sitting there. They had been friends for a long time, and they were talking, and, you know, you just can hear people talking, you know. People know, don't know inside voice, okay? So they were just talking, and, and so one of them asked, well, uh, about his, the other guy's daughter going to college. And so he talked about them looking at colleges. And then where it went after that is, well, did she find a good party life? And then they start talking about that for a long time. You know, and this is the girl's dad. And I thought, how weird. You know, I never asked my kids when they went to college, hey, are you having a good party life? Okay, no, it's, how are your grades? What are, what are you doing within things? But it, it's about party life, and that's what a lot of people look at. I'm going to college for, for party life, and, and that works for a little while until the grades don't work. And it's not just in, in secular, it's other places. It's sometimes different degrees of what fun is. But a lot of times they will go for a while, and some learn very quickly that the drinking, the short-term relationships, they come quick. They die quick as well. And you're there just kind of chasing the wind. Nothing gets accomplished. Sometimes even a degree comes and, and really still nothing's accomplished within that. But I've seen others in going into the same environments, but they had purpose. Oh, they were after a degree. They were looking at things for the future, but they already had a purpose. And for so many, their purpose is to live for God. And so, so often they tied into a, a Christian ministry. 
if it's a campus house or, or whatever there. And instead of going on spring break when it's, you know, go act like an idiot and see if you survive, uh, they, they go on missions trips to help other people. They, they serve in, in homeless shelters, still going to school, okay, still a lot of times having to work to get through school, but they have purpose. And there's a big difference within the outcome. If you're just chasing the wind and you find out a lot of paths are just false paths. They do not accomplish. They do not get you anywhere. They do not create a good life. But our purpose, as Solomon said, you read Ecclesiastics, it's a downer until you get to the end. In chapter 12, he says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Too bad he wasted most of his life. But he finally came to that, that conclusion. You know, everything else, if we just say, the good life is just having the world, it'll let us down. We will be lacking. But we can live here upon, on this world and if we're the, the king like Solomon or we are someone else, that there are good things in life. And God has given us a lot of good things. But the good life, the purpose of what we were meant for is to live for God. Now here he says fear, but it's not the fear that I'm afraid I tremble from God, that aspect. But it's the aspect I'm in awe of God. I love God. Okay, And because I love God, then I love other people. I carry his things out. That is our purpose within life. See, there's really two pictures of life. One is counterfeit. But people keep buying it over and over again. And as Solomon says, it's meaningless. You're just chasing the wind. But we also see that God says, no. Gratitude. As Paul told us, giving thanks, purpose, as Solomon says. You know, he says, I'm summing it all up. Here's the conclusion. Fear God. Keep his commandments. He says, I've been down all those roads further than you could ever go. You will not find it. It's about following God. A good life comes when we learn to give thanks and when we live with a greater sense of purpose here upon this earth, a purpose that comes from a deeper relationship with God, there's a couple of those traits. Giving thanks, gratitude, and purpose as God created us to, to live. As the worship team comes up, Solomon told us this, we only are here for a little time here upon this earth. So we have to make sure we learn what makes for a good life, right? What makes for a good life? We can't let a t-shirt define it for us, even though those may be good things in life, but they don't make for a good life. So let's make sure today that we continue or that we start today to give thanks in every day. Scripture tells us all good things come from above. Let's give thanks back to the one that gives good things. And then also a lot of times through the people that God gives those good things through. Give thanks to them as well. And let God keep shaping our lives and then the choices we make just keep being lived out in the way we live, in the way we love, the way we, we give our days here upon this earth. Let's stand together.